text is taken from Colossians, uh, the first chapter, uh, verses 15 through 28. Uh, the time is 60 AD, which is only 27 years after uh, the ascension of Christ uh, and um, uh, after his crucifixion and resurrection. And uh, the place is from Rome. Paul has written this letter uh, as he is under house arrest. Um, the thing that I love about Paul is that um, even in his trials or tribulations, he can still see God. And uh, one of the things that, um, is there a way that you can put it on slideshow, please? is that he, as he saw the Roman guard um, and he started talking about, uh, thank you very much, as he started talking about the, 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 the outfit that the, the armor that the uh, soldier was wearing, he could understand and get a message from God about that. And it really goes to prove to us that God is still talking even in the midst of uh, trials and tribulations. As you go through whatever you're going through, Brother Leon, you will see God in the midst of it. And God is still speaking. He is not silent, but he is still speaking even in the midst of trials and tribulations. So Rome is where uh, Paul is at this time, again, under house arrest. And this is Greater Emmanuel Apostolic Temple uh, Sunday School. We appreciate being here today on February 11th. And my name is Sister Carol Wade. And next slide, please want to talk about what the lesson outline is. It is Christ is the creator of the world, which is the first part of the lesson, uh, uh, verses 15 through 17. Christ is the head of the church, which is Colossians verses 18 through 23. And then it's Christ is the hope of glory, which concludes uh, the lesson uh, that we have today, which is the 24th through the 28th verse. And if you see the, the lesson is all about Christ. And so next slide. Uh, the aim of today is to examine a passage that reveals the deity and the reconciling ministry of Christ. And so you will see that he is not only God, but that his role was to reconcile man back to God. All right. And you will see the, the, the way that he is able to do that. And only God is able to do it. All right. And so the principle is to teach that Jesus Christ and him alone is fully qualified to reconcile uh, sinners to Christ. And uh, this was necessary because he found that the church at Colossae and not only the church at Colossae, but all of the churches were uh, being infiltrated with information that was not necessarily true. And so, um, I, I think it's real interesting that even though the rest of the book talks about, you know, all the things that were going on in the uh, the church at Colossae, is he starts chapter one off with a bang. It's like the entire chapter is he's going full speed ahead. And so the application today is to help people and students fully understand and appreciate who Jesus is and what he came to do because it's amazing that you can be in the church for a long time and not have a full understanding of what God has done for us. And many times, if you don't read the scriptures, you are going off of what other people have said. And so it's really important that as you grasp today's lesson is not just for entertainment, it is for you to understand fully what God has done for you. And he does a great job of that in chapter one. Next slide. Okay, so the I copied this exactly from the commentary that we were studying uh, today. And it says, this week's lesson firmly establishes the uncompromisable foundation that Jesus is God. Now, I, I don't want you to miss that point. And that's the reason why I made sure that I copied it directly from uh, the commentary um, because I wanted you to understand that this is the premise under which Paul starts this lesson. And he goes on to prove it in uh, this first chapter. And so next slide. I want also to understand what the definition of supremacy is and it's being superior to all others in authority, power and status. That means this is where you rank 
Jesus, all right? Is it according to, you know, I always ask this question um, all the time. And it's what, what do you think about Jesus? Is Jesus here to help you execute your life? Or is it that I am trying to live my life according to what Jesus has identified for me to do, all right? There's a significant difference in that because what God has charged you to do, he enables you to do, which means that God is supreme and whatever he tells you to do, he's gonna enable you to do it. That's a little different from I'm living my life and God is enabling me to do it. Does that make, I mean, does that, uh, I, I need you to put it in the chat uh, since I can't see, just does that make sense? There's a huge difference between those two perspectives about Christ. Again, am I living my life and, and using God as a helper to do that? Or am I listening to him and obeying God and walking out what he would have me to do? All right. And that depends on how you rank God. Is he supreme or is he your helper? Next slide. I got to hurry up because I know. Uh, so here's some background. Next slide. I'm sorry, Sister White. I appreciate you. All right. <laughs> so I want you to pay attention to where these churches are. Uh, Colossae is uh, in Asia Minor, uh, which is on the uh, right that I have circled. Uh, Ephesus is beside it. It's about 120, 100 to 20, 100 to 120 miles from Colossae. So it's about the distance between Cincinnati and Columbus. And uh, Paul is writing from Rome, which is on the far left. All right. He's in prison, but he has to make sure that this information gets to the church at Colossae. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So you will see the beautiful yarn on uh, the left-hand side. So let's talk a little bit about the city of Colossae. And so if you will go ahead and next, 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 next. And I won't have to keep saying next. All right, it's located in uh, H Minor. It was a wealth and it was wealthy due to its wool population or industry, uh, specifically the purple colored wool. Uh, that it had that no other city had. It was also uh, on the main trade route from the Aegean Sea uh, to the Euphrates, which boosted their economy of um, the city. Uh, next, I think there are two more of these. It was considered a small town by the time um, Paul was writing to it, it had mixed population, both Jewish and Greek families. Uh, one commentary said there were at least 2000 Jewish families uh, that lived in um, uh, uh, Colossae. And there were also Greek families that lived there. When you have both populations and when you have mixed population, uh, like the United States has, a lot of rituals and a lot of things that people believe will be a part of the culture. I think there's one other slide or one other bullet point. Okay. Um, and as a result of having multiple um, cultures and rituals that existed in the city, um, there were a lot of things that were creeping into the church. Um, as it relates to today and what Colossae is doing today, it was damaged by earthquake and it is an unexcavated mound. Most of the things that they know about Colossae was based on coins that they had found and they could figure out the history based on some of the other objects that were uh, identified, but not necessarily the city itself because they haven't seen it. Um, next slide. Okay, so, you know, builds really help when uh, you are pushing the button, all right? So the church was established by, uh, I will say Epaphras because that's how I used to pronounce the word, but I think it's Epaphras, all right? Uh, so you say it any way you like, all right? So the church was established by Epaphras <laughs> and um, uh, this um, a man of God is mentioned in the letters to the Colossians and also uh, in the book of Philemon. Uh, and he is mentioned as our dear fellow servant by Paul, 
or a faithful minister of Christ, a fellow prisoner, a servant of uh, Christ Jesus, and always wrestling in prayer and working hard. And so he acknowledges that uh, in his letter, he acknowledges that he has a huge appreciation of the person that started their church, all right? And Paul himself had not been to the church, but Paul Epaphras had, Epaphras, that's what I'm going to say, all right, Epaphras had been to see Paul in jail, and he had told him about some of the issues that were going on in the church and uh, how great the church was. The purpose of the letter is to encourage and refocus this church on the fact that Christ is supreme and is all that you need. All right, next slide. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, again, uh, to adjust, address the cultural issues that had infiltrated the church, like I said, the Greek and the Jewish traditions. All right. Um, some of the, those were uh, polytheism, and they said that polytheism and mysticism were early stages of Gnosticism, which is one of the things or uh, one of the things that we know about the Greeks. And when you say Gnostics, they were people that believed in knowing. And they almost celebrated the fact that they were educated. They, these were the people that were at Mars, at the hill of Mars, where they had all these um, uh, statues to all the gods because they loved information. And many times we in uh, today, we get excited about information. We got to know a lot of things. And the knowing of a lot of things is not what's going to save you. And so that is what uh, Gnosticism in um, a very um, primary example of what Gnosticism is. Uh, but you remember on Mars Hill, one of the things that they had was if we missed anybody, there was a statue to the unknown God. And that's where Paul began, began to uh, minister, all right, on the fact that I'm going to tell you about this unknown God that you don't know about. Other things that were, um, uh, they had some idea about angels. Um, there was circumcision, schism, circumcision that was continuing to creep back into the church. The eating of clean and unclean food, which was Jewish observance and laws. And then um, it is Paul's intention to uh, directly address these issues. Uh, but he first uh, begins by setting the foundation of the faith in chapter one. And so I said all that. Hopefully that is the end of my background. Next slide. Uh, well, not exactly. All right. <laughs> okay. So Paul begins his letter to the Colossians as a true apostolic father. Again, he has not been there, but he has heard about them and he knows about them. And as an apostolic father who um, is acquainted with uh uh, Epaphras, he is sharing with them, you know, things that will help to encourage them. Encourage them. And so he begins in uh, chapter one, verses uh, uh, one through 14. This is prior to our lesson. He begins with greetings and an introduction of himself. All right. And uh, he also uh, talks about Epaphras. And uh, he says that he quickly lets them know that he is praying for them that they might uh, do and have all these things, number uh, one through five. And it says, be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. These are all good things for us to have. These were all saved people, but they also had to be filled with the knowledge of his will and uh, all wisdom and spiritual understanding. It is not our will, but it is God's will that we have to have an, a spiritual understanding of God's will, which means to us that after we get saved, there is still growth and understanding that we are going to need. All right. Number two, we have to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, which means that not only do we have to know this, but we also have to follow this. We have to live out our lives. I go back to uh, our, was it last? No, it was a couple of weeks ago. We talked about. Um, it was Ephesians chapter five, and it says, be followers of Christ, which means be imitators of Christ, not just to know about it, but we have to be followers also. It says, be fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. These are the things that 
uh, Paul is praying for them and it is, they are things that we also have to know ourselves and we also have to be fruitful in every good work, all right? We have to, in the knowledge of God, yes, we have to read our word, <laughs> meditate on it. We have to pray and ask God to show himself strong in our lives so that we will be able to talk from experience and from an understanding that we do know this God that we say we serve because he is a knowable God. He is a God that is not far away, but if we want to know him, ah, my God, he is a God that can be known because he is within us. And it says we also need to be strengthened by all might according to his glorious power uh, unto patience, long-suffering, and joyfulness. So there are some characteristics that we must demonstrate as a result of the strength that he gives us according to his glorious power. So these are all things that we have to have, and he is praying for um, uh, the folks at Colossae. All right, so we are going to go into the lesson. Uh, tell me what, how much time I have, because I don't have a clock in here. Sister White, are you there? Oh yeah, you have, um, you, you, you could go, just just uh go don't don't you don't have to rush okay um the lesson starts he has just talked about christ and then in verse number 15 he says who is the image of the invisible god the firstborn of every creature all right and verse number 16 and 17 i'll go ahead and read it says for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So, uh, and he is before all things and by him, all things consist. All right, so as I said, this lesson, Paul is saying up front, I am telling you that Jesus is God, that Christ is God, all right? And it says, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? Matthew uh, chapter one, verse 18 says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Uh, when his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was in Mary and Mary's flesh, not, not anything else, but Mary's flesh wrapped around uh, the Holy Ghost, all right? Which is different than when God created Adam I just found this to be different. It's like he he created Adam from the dust of the earth and then he blew his breath into him. In this example, Holy Ghost, already fully Holy Ghost and all of God what found her, himself or found itself in Mary and Mary's flesh, not Joseph, but Mary's flesh wrapped her, himself or itself around the Holy Ghost, all right? And so it says in the image, when we were in Exodus, uh, we find that, that Moses has said to God, I want to know who you are. I want to see you. And so God hides him in the cliff of the mountain. And God says, I'm going to put my hand up until I pass. And when I pass, you can see the back of me. And that thing, um, uh, I, I kept, I was like, God, what is, what is Moses seeing? Because you are a spirit. So what is it that that Moses is seeing the back of. And uh, I can tell you, I don't know, but I do know that God made himself visible and there were many theophanies of God, many uh, in the, in the uh, Old Testament, even when Moses was on at the burning bush, there was an angel that came out of, that, that spoke to him in the burning bush. There were many um, examples where we see God manifest himself, but none like the birth of, of Christ, none like Christ, all right? And then uh, Hebrews chapter one, verse three, it says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. So he is the express image of God's person. And uh, it says, when he had him served, purged all sins. So now we know that we're talking about Christ. Uh, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And it's like, if God is a spirit, where is his right hand? 
And so it does not mean literal his right hand, but it means that his hand of power is where God or Jesus is positioned. All right. I hope that makes sense. Uh, in Hebrews chapter one, verse two, it says, have in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he have appointed heir of all things. So when you talk about the firstborn of every creature, I must say that that was, uh, that has caused me some, um, I don't want to say angst, but it caused me to not necessarily understand that in its fullness, because firstborn identifies that it is a, a creature. All right. And then, so the, the commentary identified that it meant his placement as being the heir, all right? The firstborn, which meant that he was entitled to all rights and privileges of uh, God on high. And uh, I think there's something else that goes with that. And I'm gonna ask God to continue to help me to understand that because there's another scripture in Corinthians that, that uh, I'm still trying to figure out how that works in with this firstborn of every creature. But if you think of it as the commentary identifies that it talks about his rights and privileges. And uh, there's a scripture that talks about, he thought it not robbery uh, to be God or equal with God. Uh, I said, now how Lord am I gonna teach this lesson if I'm getting tripped over over this first uh, verse, all right? <laughs> so I will say that I will understand it better by and by. And if you have something that you wanna share on that, please do. Uh, so if it's something other than uh, his rightful place as heir, all right? So for by him were all things created, and so in Genesis 1 and 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We already established that. But in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So if God, if the word was God, then you can say, in the beginning, the word created the heavens and the earth. And then it says in uh, chapter one, verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, if that's not Jesus Christ, I'm not exactly sure how you're reading your Bible. All right. And this has helped me when I was trying to figure out the oneness of God versus the Trinity. I was like, these kind of scriptures were, were the ones that helped me to understand that uh, Jesus Christ is God. All right. And that, and there is oneness in God. All right, and it says in verse uh, number three, it's in, in that same chapter of John, first chapter, it says, all things were made by him and without him was not anything that was made, which goes back to he created the heavens and the earth. And then John uh, 14, verse nine, and it says, Jesus said unto him, have I been so long time with you and yet has thou not known me, uh, Philip? He's talking to Philip. And he that has seen me has seen the father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father. All right, so Jesus continues to reiterate this whole thing that I am, we are, I am God manifested in flesh. All right, next page. Okay, Sister White. Yeah, it's stuck for some reason. Oh no. <laughs> okay. So apparently God does uh, or the devil does not want uh this information to be shared. All right. <laughs> so all right, and it says in verse number 18. Okay. Still stuck? I don't know. I don't know why it's not. It's not moving. Okay, so can you take it out of... Um, there oh. you go. There you go. All right, in verse number 18, it says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is from, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. All right, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and it says, it says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And so 
Ephesians uh, uh, solidifies the same thing that Christ is the head of the church. And um, when it says the firstborn from the dead, it's talking about the resurrection. And I wanna make a clarification that Lazarus was raised from the dead and Jesus was resurrected. He says the firstborn because all of us will be resurrected uh, uh, at some point uh, in when when it, when the Lord comes back. That's what we're going to do. Those who are dead in Christ shall um, be resurrected first, and then those who are alive and remain shall also be res shall shall rise up to meet Him. And so, uh, since He has done that, because when He died, He was buried. He died. He really died. And then he rose up in um, his new body, all right? And then the word preeminence says surpassing all others and superiority. And I go back to what I shared before uh, in Ephesians chapter five. If you believe that God is preeminent over your life, then you must be followers or imitators of him and not just recognize him as a helper to you, all right? I, I put this picture in here and it says, for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell. And so if you look at um, the picture and, and I'm saying to you that this is a portion of the Holy Spirit. And if you look on the right, there's, there's a 30% portion of the Holy Ghost. And then you go all the way to uh, the left and it's 100%, it says, it pleased the father that in him should dwell all fullness. Um, and so the, the entire essence of God is in Christ, which is that 100%, all right? The essence of God is in Christ. And imagine that that 100% is now wrapped in flesh, all right? And, and I thought, nobody's gonna get this picture, but... <laughs> It's like in my crazy brain, this made sense to me, all right? And so uh, I just want you to understand that uh, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And they're talking about Christ. All right, so the fullness of God. And so uh, let's go to the next. All right, so um, in verses 20, uh, through 23, it says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And uh, in Genesis uh, chapter three, verse 15, um, in the garden, because of Adam and uh, um, Eve, there was sin that was committed and uh, in uh, chapter three, verse 15, it says, and I will establish, no, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel, all right? And so even though this is talking about they have been separated from God, it also talks about the Messiah that is to come. And uh, even though the body uh, which is the heel shall be bruised by the enemy. Um, it's saying that the Christ, the Christos, will bruise the head of the serpent, all right? And so um, we know that Christ was crucified and by his blood, he was able to reconcile all things unto himself. And so one of the things that we know from the Old Testament scriptures is that whatever sin was committed, a sacrifice had to be made. Every sacrifice up to the point of Jesus was an insufficient sacrifice and they had to keep making the sacrifices over and over again. But once Jesus came, it's like, we must be grateful. Paul is telling them to be grateful for Jesus because he was the sacrifice as the lamb that was slain. He also carried the sacrifice as the high priest when he ascended into heaven. He told Mary not to touch him because he had not yet ascended into his father. And then uh, he accepted the sacrifice as God. 
And so everything that we need uh, from a reconciliation standpoint, everything that we need is in Jesus. Because of the blood, because of the blood that he sacrificed, because of the blood that he carried, and because of the blood that he accepted, we now have a relationship with God uh, uh, as long as we stay in him. All right. And it says, and you were, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. And so he wanted the Colossians and all of us to understand that we were enemies of God. We were enemies and we were alienated, oh my God, from the God of salvation. There was no way uh, for us to get uh, a, a right relationship with him unless the sacrifice had been made, unless a sacrifice, a, a worthy sacrifice had been made. And it said, and, and Jesus was that sacrifice. And it says in the body of his flesh through death, that's how he made the sacrifice. He was able to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight because the blood that covers us, the blood of the sacrifice that covers us, we are able to, to show up to God as having no spot, uh, no blemish and unreprovable in his sight. Thank God for the blood. If it had not been for God, enabling himself to wrap himself up in flesh, to come and be a sacrifice for us, we would not be able to have right relationships. So if God requires us to be in right relationship, then he is making it possible because of what he has done for us. Ah, what a mighty God we serve. There's a word called propitiation, which everybody uh, I'm sure already knows. And it's, it, it represents an atonement for the separation that happened in the garden. And so if you look at atonement, it says at, at one meant, or the state of being at one with God, all right? And our sins have been taken away. And so you need to understand that because it's not just a story that we need to tell, but it is our hope uh, because in, in, in verse number 23, it says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It's, it, every time I read these scriptures, I was like, there's everything, there's a whole lot in every phrase here. And it says, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, God is, or Paul is saying, or God is saying through Paul, is like you have to continue to stay under the blood. That was one of the things that in the um, uh, the Old Testament is like in order for them to, to be saved when uh, the plagues came is that they had to stay in the house and they had to be covered by the blood. Ah, uh, because in the house you are covered, all right? Even when you go back to Noah, they had to stay in, it, it was a type of Christ because they had to stay in the ark. If they stayed in the ark, then they were saved. And what they are saying here, there are a lot of things. It, the children of Israel will stay when there was, um, I remember uh, Pastor Daniel talking about this a long time ago when I was in New Saints class, but he started talking about the types of Christ, even the, the cloud that covered them as they walked out of Egypt into the promised land as they were walking in the wilderness. As long as they stayed under the cloud, then they were saved. As long as they stayed under the auspices of uh, God, then they were saved. And that's what Paul is saying in the scripture today. If you continue in the faith and the understanding that God has made, the, or Jesus has made this sacrifice for you and that God has accepted that that sacrifice and a result of the sacrifice. I'm stammering over my words and everything. I hope y'all can understand me. But as long as you stay under the blood, then uh, it says, which it's like, if you continue in faith and be not moved away from the hope, I'm sorry, uh, away from the hope of the gospel which he have heard and which was preached to every creature 
It's like, this is how you stay unblameable, unreprovable in his sight. All right, in chapter eight of uh, Romans, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, all right? If we are in Christ, there is no condemnation to us, all right? And so that, you know, as I go back and I look at everything that is in chapter one, uh, Paul is laying a serious foundation for these people because he cannot talk to them about the things that they have gotten into, which you will hear in the later uh, lessons uh, regarding this, unless he sets up the standard, unless he sets up the foundation uh, that Christ is God and that he wrapped himself up in flesh to come and be a sacrifice for us. And uh, that sacrifice was received by himself. And we are now unblameable and uh, without reproof and in his sight, as long as we stay in him. All right, uh, next slide. And it says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up, which a commentary identified as accept, that which is behind uh, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. All right. Paul, in that scripture, Paul is referencing his imprisonment and declares that uh, he is happy to or accepts his part to uh, participate in the suffering of the sake of Christ. And uh, that is one thing that Brother Leon was alluding to earlier is that the things that have motivated him is to understand that his suffering is for the sake of Christ and he has to be happy about that. And he says that Paul says that he is a minister, a representative of Christ as his minister for this time and dispensation. Um, if you are accepting of the fact that Christ suffered, all right, then when you suffer for his sake, it should make you happy, all right? And uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 12 says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. 1 Peter chapter 4, 13 says, um, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And um, I believe that it takes a real understanding of what God has done. If God has done this for us and he suffered for our sake, then if we suffer, when we know we will, then we should be happy because we too then are partakers of uh, the suffering. If we are partakers of the suffering, as First Peter identifies, then we'll, we will be partakers of the glory which shall be revealed in us, which shall be revealed at a later date. There is, if we suffer, then we shall also reign with him. And those are the things you have to look past what you are going through today to know that there is a greater reward for you that is waiting for you other than what you're going through right now. Verse number 25 says, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is giving to, given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, it says, Whereby are, given, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, all right? We're gonna escape that. If you can just hold on, I know that we are going through a lot, but if you can just hold on and you understand that we are partakers because the enemy is soon to come and he's throwing out all things at us. He's throwing, you know, darts. Remember, we had to have the armor on from uh, last week's lesson that uh, Brother uh, Guy preached, I mean, uh, taught. It's like, because 
we know that the enemy is throwing darts at us. But if we can endure those and understand that we're the enemy is not throwing darts at people that are not uh, a threat to what he wants. But if we can have the mindset that if we can endure those, we will be partakers of the divine nature and the promises which are to come. Can you go to the next slide? Oh, I had a question there. And I think the question had to do with, do you look at your uh, sufferings in this way? And if you don't, then we, you have to continue to ask God to transform your thinking so that and transform your mind back in Romans, which is one of my favorites also, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can see things the way God has uh, uh, sees things, all right? Uh, in verse number 27 or 26 through 28, which it goes to the end of the lesson, it says, even the mystery which have been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. To him, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ. All right, so the mystery there are a few things that are mysteries. And one is Romans 8 and 18. It says, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. The mystery is that more is coming. Good is coming. It's going to be so good. It's going to make you forget about the things that you have gone through. And when I think about the things that I'm going through, just know that your glory that you will receive is going to be greater than that. And it's like, so if you're going through a hard time, know that the things that are coming your way are going to be uh, even greater than what you have gone through. And um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, I get excited about that, but I'm trying to finish this lesson, all right? Uh, chapter 4, verse 17, it says, for our light affliction is but for a moment. And it worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Anything that has weight, it has substance. Anything that they talk about weight, they are talking about, it, it's not a light thing like they call the afflictions. Afflictions are light things. They may seem heavy to us right now. It's like, but it will be a light thing uh, compared to the weight of the glory which shall be revealed. Mm. Exciting, exciting, exciting. If I can just get my mind to continue to think about that when somebody says something negative, it when I have to go through a challenge, it's like I have to keep remembering because this is what the scripture is for, to help us to remember what God says, not what you think, but what God has said. What God says is that whatever I'm going through, I don't care how bad it is, it is but a light affliction and it is... Um, it, it, there will be an exceeding and eternal weight of glory that is coming, all right, for us, all right? The second mystery is that these riches and glory of Christ are for the Gentiles also. And so, uh, you know, he has to establish that because one of the things that they were dealing with is that the Jews were trying to take them back um, to following, they were talking about the, you know, superiority of the Jewish laws and the things that they had to follow. And they wanted them to be circumcised uh, because they felt that the preeminence was in being Jewish. And God is continuing to say that the preeminence is understanding that it is in Christ that we live, move, and have our being and that he has brought salvation, and this is how we have been reconciled with God. But uh, he is also saying that uh, all of these things are not just for Jews. All of these things are for everybody, all right? And then the third mystery, uh, and this is the secret, that Christ lives in us. Once you have accepted um, the sacrifice that, that Christ has made, you know, and you have been baptized and you have received his spirit. Christ lives in you. 
It's not something that just visits you every now and then. Christ lives in you and he is changing you from the inside out. And it says this should give you an assurance of his glory. And we talked and maybe um, our brother Leah can talk about an earnest, but we talk about the earnest of his spirit, which is God is giving us a little bit of himself <clears throat> so that he so that he can show us that he's serious about our salvation. And an earnest money is when you want to buy a house, you have to put down a down payment that says that you're not playing. You put down an earnest that says, I'm serious about buying this house. And it shows um, the seller that, oh, I have a true buyer here because they're invested in it. And that's what God has done for us. Um, he has, when we receive the Holy Ghost, that is him living in us, changing us, but it's not all of him. It is a, a portion of the quality of, of the spirit, all right? That is working on the inside, changing us on the outside. And he says, he preaches Christ, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, uh, uh, all the wisdom of God that we present them mature in their relationship to Christ. So this is him telling uh, 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 the Colossian church that this is the reason why he preaches and teaches because he wants to make sure that everybody is mature in their relationship with Christ. It is not just a, it goes further than being baptized in Jesus name and being filled with this Holy Spirit. He wants all of us to understand the foundation upon which we stand so that we are not threatened, that we are not shaken from our, our beliefs because there are a lot of things that are coming at us today. There will be a lot more coming at us tomorrow. We are always off focus, it's thinking about this, thinking about that, seeing what's happening in government, seeing what's happening even in the church world. There are things that help to knock us. But if we can stand sure and, and flat-footed on the foundation that is built, that it has been established by Christ, we will not waver from uh, the left or to the right, to the left or to the right. I think I said that right. All right, next slide. Okay, so there were... I'm about finished. Uh, if you could go back uh, one slide and you. Oh my God. What? <laughs> I am so sorry. That's all right. I think I can remember what it is. Uh, okay. We talk about, you know, what are the messages that are being shared with us in the scripture? And one of the things that is being shared with us from a principle standpoint is God, is that Paul does not want uh the the church at colossian to be compromising and many times there are things that come and we accept a whole lot of things because we don't want to you know start waves or or make waves as they say it's like but he is saying do not compromise what you believe and the only way you cannot compromise what you believe is that you are sure on what you believe and so Continue um, to have faith in what it is that you believe and who it is that you believe. And so we all have to ask ourselves one final question. And that is, and it's a rhetorical question. It's not for me to know the answer, but it's for you to know the answer. And it's, it says, do you really fully understand who Jesus is and what he did for you? Because the answer to this question is going to identify how you uh, move in the future, what you do in the future, what things come to you and how much you receive. And I think um, there is one other thing, I think, or maybe that was the final question. That, it says that's the final question. You know, that might not be the final thing that I say. All right. <laughs> okay. So if you don't believe, if you don't know what you believe, I think it was a, the, the word before that or the slide before that. If you yeah. don't or don't know what you believe, then you will fall for anything. And that is one of the things that I wanted to share. And then it says, 
do you really know what you believe? All right. And uh, if you know what you believe, then you will not treat God like he's a helper to help you get through this life, even though he is. But uh, you will treat him as preeminent. I will do what you say. I'm living this life the way you would have me to live it because I believe that you are supreme and whatever I am to do, I'm, I'm, this world is not my home and I'm not living here to be satisfied fully with everything that is in this world. But what I am doing is I'm trying to live so I can speak to people about the God that I know and let them know that this God is also for you and has done um, great things and made a sacrifice for you if you just believe him. Oh my God, if you just receive the sacrifice, if you just receive the blood, you will be able to live blamelessly like all of us. And we will also be partakers in the glory which shall be revealed. Ah, I think, I hope you got, oh Lord, I'm sorry. It's 1030. It's not a problem. <laughs> we needed every word you said. And then some, I'm sorry that you felt like you had to rush, but um you know, we just blessed to be able to have you uh, to teach the to teach the word, you know, to be uh, consistent um, and give us a better understanding. We may can't grasp it all. Right. But that first verse that you read in this lesson, when it said, who is the image yeah. of the invisible God? Yeah. The firstborn of every creature. He is the image of the invisible God. And so I look at that as a reflection right. of who God is. When you look in a mirror, you see Carol Wade. The image. When I look in the mirror, it's a reflection of who Sandra really is. This is who Jesus is. Right, right, He's right. the image of God. If you want to know, nobody can look in the mirror and say, oh, that's not really Carol Wade. Right, right, right. That's right. somebody else. So if you don't understand the full dynamics of it, just think about the image, the reflection of God, that is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. God is awesome. The yeah. lesson was powerful. We are so grateful that we ate good this morning. We really ate good this morning. And I want to thank you all so much for uh, coming to Sunday School. Sister Melanie Moon, are you there? We will continue to pray for Preston and Sister May Clark uh, with all the things that she's been dealing with. And uh, God is able. Minister Moon. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Did you have something to say? Beautiful lesson, beautiful lesson. I really enjoyed where she brought out how we have to stay in the house, even as the Israelites were uh, were told by by God to stay in the house and uh, put that blood on the on the doorposts, and he would and the death angel would pass over. And staying in the ark, the ark of safety, as Noah and his family, uh, so important. No in and out. No, no. Uh, you're, I'm, I'm with the Lord today, and 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 not tomorrow. But it is a consistent lifestyle. I also like the images of being filled up. Those those men being filled up different levels Amen. of the Holy Ghost, and I want to be filled, filled, filled to the brim, as I know uh, the rest of you do as well. Thank you, Sister Carol, for that beautiful lesson. Amen. God bless you, Minister Moon. The supremacy of Christ. And every, I like when you brought, about, uh, brought out about the problems that we are confronted with on a daily basis. And you know how you said that it's going to get worse because the enemy is always testing us. I heard a message this week. Don't abort the mission. Yeah. Amen. Don't abort the mission just because you're having a few little problems and, you know, and we all are going through some things. And a lot of times these tests and trials that we're dealing with make us feel like we need to just give up, throw in the towel, you know, no, baby, don't abort the mission. Hang in there. Amen. Bishop Brown used to always say this, he that shall come, will come and will not tarry. 
Yes, yes, yes. The supremacy of Christ and whatever it is that you're going through, make him bigger yes. than the problems that you are confronted with. Make him to be the Lord and master over every test and trial that you are dealing with. I do also like the graph that you show, a little bit of God, <laughs> you know, here a little, there a little, you know, but the fullness of Christ is where we're trying to get to. Being, being totally committed, being totally uh, at, his, at his will, at his beckoning call. Because let me tell you something, all that Jesus did for us, when he came down through 42 generations and died on at, at Calvary and then rose again and, and went back to sit at the right hand of the Father, if he did all of that for us, what more will he do with these little tests and trials that we're dealing with? But yeah. Pastor Paul said, these are the light afflictions. They are just for a moment. But what these afflictions are doing is working all this crap out of us so that we can be able to receive the full benefit of the blessing. Amen. You're going to go through something in this life to get something. Nothing's going to be handed to you. Out of all what Jesus did, don't you think he deserved for you to go through some things so you could prove your love to him? And Sister Carol, you did such an excellent, excellent job. Uh, I didn't feel and worthy. Brother Lee, I want to talk about that earnest money. <laughs> Amen. What about that earnest money, Brother Leon? Earnest money is in real estate, like she said, you put the money down to let you know you're serious. And like I said, with me right now, I'm trying to do nothing to grieve my Holy Spirit. That's my earnest money. I'm putting it down. Don't <laughs> stop anything that's grieving the Holy Spirit. Stop the power from coming through. I'm trying Amen. to put all that away and just lean on, on, on God. You know what they say, put your money where your mouth is. Yes, yes. You know, Amen. everybody a Christian these days. So yeah. either put up or shut up. And what yes. God is telling us through this lesson yeah. is to live this life. Yeah. I want to see some fruits. Yeah. I want to see that you really believe what you say you believe. And that's where all of us are at. That's why all of these tests and trials that we are dealing with on a daily basis is proving who are you really? Do you know what God is for real? And one of the questions that you ask, do you really know who God is? What you Not have. just by what you're talking. Right. Have you experienced what? Christ? Have you experienced the supremacy of Christ in your life? So that's, yeah. it's, you know, put up a shut up. That's all I'm saying. This and so we want to thank you so much. Amen. Lovely Brother lady, we appreciate you and your ministry, and all of you that come. We are so grateful Hallelujah. that you all come to fellowship with us on a weekly basis. We know you've been praying for us somewhere along the line in your week because we pray for you as well. So eternal God, we thank you today. We praise you. We magnify you. We glorify you for being the supremacy in our life, for giving us an opportunity to know who you are, to know, Lord God, the sacrifice that you have made for us. We thank you, Lord God, for making it possible for us to be able to come boldly to the throne of grace, to obtain mercy and find help in the time of trouble and need. Thank you for Sister Carol, Lord God, for how she blessed us today. Lord God, thank you for every student that have come. Thank you, Lord God, for every prayer that was prayed. Lord God, every soul that has been ministered to. We pray that you will continue to bless us all, that you will continue to bless Sister May, Brother Preston. Remember, Lord God, Brother Leon, as he goes uh, uh, for his uh, MRI this week. All of us, Lord God, in some way, shape, or form need to hear from you and need to know, Lord God. We want you to know that we love you, we appreciate you, and we magnify your magnificent name. All these things we ask for uh, divine protection this week. Whatever the people need, Lord God, we bring it to you because you know all things, Lord. 
And we thank you for making it possible for us to be here today. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you. you guys have a great week. Thank you, Brother Roy.